Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to be talking about the Chart House and its associated spaces. And in the past we've talked a lot about the bridge, uh, and we've even shown the Chart House in some of our videos, but we haven't explicitly gone through these spaces. So, it'll be a nice short video about what these spaces were, who worked here, all that sort of stuff. So, the uh, chart house on an Iowa-class battleship is a series of about three rooms. We'll go through a couple of other adjoining rooms and closets and things while we're here. But uh, about three rooms here on the O4 level of the ship, just aft of the armored conning tower, which is forward through these portholes. Technically, the bridge is a weather space. Even though it's fully enclosed, it doesn't have watertight doors or windows, and it's expected that uh, it's never going to be all that uh, comfortable climate controlled and things are not watertight in there. By contrast, the chart house is a watertight space. It has actual bulkheads, not just joiner bulkheads, and uh, watertight doors and watertight portholes, like on the forward side here. The chart house would have been the domain of the quartermasters. You may think of quartermasters in an army context where they're the supply guys, but on a ship, they are the helmsmen and the navigators. Uh, the navigating, of course, is interesting. You know, reading plans and uh, directing your radar, and, and actually you're responsible for the sh which way the ship is going and how it's going. And radar, of course, the radar man would be telling us whether there's anything there. But uh, most of my time was on the helm at that and doing our plans and setting up our plot plans for wherever direction we were being told to go. And the battleship would have had a navigating officer who was in charge of all of this. Obviously, knowing where you are is very important, so it's worth having uh, officers specifically focused on that. Even though there are other officers like the gunnery officer, the engineering officer, the supply officer, who oversee basically one-third of the crew each, like, this might be a relatively small subset, but it's one of the most important jobs of the ship, and it's something you need even in peacetime. So, what are some key features here in the chart house? Well, one, We've got doors, port, and starboard, so that the captain or anybody else, officer of the deck, can circle through here. Each of those doors has a light locker associated with it. This one back here is an example, and there's one on the other side as well. And, uh, pardon the mess in here, we are off the tour route, and we are currently in the process of restoring the bridge. So you're going to see a lot of tools and parts and pieces and cleaning supplies up here, and it doesn't look like a restored space, and you'll see a lot of chipped paint. Well, that's because our volunteers are working through it. If you'd like to come out and help them, there's a link in the comment section down below for where you can contact the museum. So basically, a light locker, and we've covered this before, is just a black painted room. There's black tile on the floor. Uh, there is a joiner door here. doesn't need to be watertight. Out there, there is an actual watertight door. That watertight door hits a contactor, so as soon as that door opens, the lights in here go out, so that we're not going to be putting light out at night. We have a surface search navigation set here, just to help see what's around you. And then we've got this desk with all these drawers. This is where all of our charts are located. Did you see the workbench is big enough to bring out a uh, chart. We've got a typewriter here so we can record the deck log every watch. But yeah, the uh, charts are numbered, they're dated, they've got what they're actually showing on them. So it's real easy to flip through here, grab whatever you need, and drop it out. Meanwhile, heading out on the starboard side of the ship, we have another light locker, another joiner door and watertight door. And then through the light locker, we enter the captain's at sea cabin. So far less luxurious than the captain's in port cabin. And we've done a separate video on his different cabins, but basically when the ship is at sea, the captain is responsible. So he always sleeps somewhere nearby uh, where the ship is navigated from. On some older, smaller ships, that meant that the captain just slung a hammock out on the weather deck outside of the bridge, back when most bridges were open and exposed when he was able to sleep at sea. Uh, by World War II, most ships have enclosed at-sea cabins like this one that are relatively close. So if there's an emergency, he can jump out of bed 
you'll notice this room is full of phones. We've got two here, a third one over there. Uh, and he's got a gyro compass repeater over his head that ticks every couple of degrees as the ship turns. Uh, so he can get a call, wake up in the middle of the night or somebody knocks on his door, uh, look at that, see what direction we're going and if it's the direction he ordered the ship to go in and then make a run for the bridge, which is right through that door. On New Jersey, the captain has his own head up here. That's not necessarily the case on all of the Iowa-class battleships. Uh, they received, it seems, different levels of modifications to this structure in the 80s. So New Jersey being the first one brought back, uh, may be closest to stock, although it's been too long since I've gone through Iowa or Missouri. Wisconsin being brought back last, uh, has the most modern facilities up here, and uh, it seems like the captain's spaces suffer for it, believe it or not, even though they've got the largest enclosed space up on the bridge. Uh, and again, pardon the mess, this isn't on the tour route, so it's not fully restored, but he's got a head with a sink and a toilet, and he's got a shower with a weird frickin' door and lock in it. This door is one of the biggest mysteries in Iowa-class battleships that I have. Uh, why is it here at all? As you can see, on the inside it's got a padlock and a knob, but on the outside here there's no knob. I don't know if that was removed intentionally while the ship was in service, or if it's one of a dozen knobs that have fallen off while the ship was a museum. Uh, this door makes no sense to me. The room we open up into uh, doesn't really uh, have a name. It is part of the chart house annex, which is this other room forward of us we'll go into in a minute. Uh, and really, this is just where we are storing the ship's chronometers. So a, a chronometer is a really precise clock that can be used for celestial navigation to find, uh, to help find longitude. Latitude's relatively easy to find, but uh, for calculating longitude, you need a really precise clock. And with mechanical clocks, the motion of the ship and the expansion and contraction of the materials that form those clocks due to temperatures on the ship uh, cause normal clocks to be really imprecise, or at least not as hyper-precise as they need to be for navigating purposes. Uh, so chronometers are made out of special materials in a special way to be super precise so that you can calculate your longitude. Uh, and, and this space seems to just be used for storing them. Uh, and an air conditioning unit, an air handling unit was installed here. We also have the navigating office, which would have been run by the navigating officer. Um, one of the theories about the door in the captain's shower is that uh, this was originally the navigating officer's cabin, so both he and the captain are close to the bridge in case there's an emergency, and they would have shared the captain's head. I'm not sure I'd buy that because we've got uh, other officer heads just one level below us and one level above us. So I don't really see that sharing his space with a lieutenant or maybe a lieutenant commander who's the navigating officer. Um, however, that is one theory. As to whether this door shows up in the plans or if it's an unauthorized ship alt, I keep four booklets of general plans in my stateroom. I don't have a complete World War II one. I, I do have a very well done modern rendering of the ship's World War II booklet of general plans. I suspect this was made by taking a later booklet of general plans and just backdating it to World War II. Um, so exterior features, I imagine, are pretty accurate. There are a lot of pictures that the designer could uh, reference to make sure that it was correct. The inside, though, I, I don't fully trust because all four Iowas are different. This one is purporting to be New Jersey. Um, however, if they're using evidence from a book of general plans from a different ship, from a different time period, 
there are chances that it's not accurate. Anyway, that book of general plans does not show this joiner door. It is just a bulkhead, like you would think it should be. Moving forward, I have a booklet of general plans for Iowa for the mid-50s. And that does show a door here. Um, and you would think that should be relatively accurate for the entire Iowa class. However, again, there are huge differences uh, with Iowa and New Jersey being very distinct from each other and extremely distinct from Missouri and Wisconsin. And Missouri and Wisconsin being the most similar, but still different enough from each other that uh, most of the time you'll see booklets of general plans for all four vessels, not just Iowa class plans. Um, New Jersey's Vietnam era plans do not show a door here. However, when they update those plans for the 1980s, my 1980s book of general plans, they modified an Iowa plan from the 50s into the New Jersey for the 80s. They did not take the 60s New Jersey plan and modify that into the 80s New Jersey plan. So maybe that shows that, so maybe that shows that this is less accurate, the Vietnam plans. Um, or maybe it just shows that those have disappeared and the Iowa plans are in much greater number. Who knows? Anyway, the 80s Book of General Plans does show this door here, as it should, because this door is here. A couple of other interesting theories I've had is that, oh, it, it's for cleaners to go in without disturbing the captain. Uh, it's so that the captain can immediately come out here, as opposed to two compartments forward onto the bridge. Uh, and, and none of these fully sit right with me. Uh, so, for the time being at least, this is still a mystery I am keen on solving. Anyway, enough about the door in the bathroom. Let's head up here to the chart house annex. Again, pardon the mess. Uh, we've got another chart table here where, where you can lay out a full chart. We've got a radio receiver here, which uh, is specifically tagged as being part of the navigating equipment. And uh, the ship does not appear to have Loran, which is uh, in the 1980s. She has a, a different thing called Omega, and I'm not sure if this is part of that and similar to, to how those work or something different. I, I just don't know enough about uh, radio sets. But this is radio receiver R1843A backslash WRN TAC 5 and then A in parentheses. Uh, you'll notice we also have a ton of shelving that's been installed here, and um, this is all used for storing manuals and that sort of stuff, log books. So, this space, uh, like I said, appears differently on different Iowa class battleships. On Wisconsin, it is significantly different than on New Jersey, and uh, like I said, I honestly can't remember Missouri or. Uh, Iowa, but I suspect they're somewhere in between uh, Wisconsin and New Jersey, being the order in which they were reactivated throughout the 80s and the number of modifications that were made. It interests me that uh, these spaces maintain the old uh, wardroom green color that the ship would have been earlier in her career and have not been painted over. Uh, in fact, when we chip this paint off, we find nothing but primer underneath. So th this space seems to have always been uh, this wardroom green color, while most of the ship has been repainted at least two different shades throughout the ship's career. Anyway, if you're interested in the shades of paint on the inside of the ship, check out our video on that. Uh, we don't get down in the weeds on this channel at all. So what are your theories on that door? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of other businesses and viewers like yourselves. We really appreciate the support you guys have given us. It allows us to keep doing what we're doing and we love what we do. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Well, I told, like I said, uh, I think being an assistant navigator of the Jersey from I guess it would be April of 
47 till December 47. Uh, uh, I did most of the na celestial navigation and, and the plotting on entering port and anchoring. And uh, uh, I, I do remember one time we were off Dominican Republic up to the north, and I remember taking star sights, even though we were within sight of land and could take a fix from the lights on the land. So I insist that we take star sights that night to plot against the visual aids. And I came out within a quarter of a mile and I was satisfied that I was a pretty good navigator. So uh, I left the ship in 19, December 47, went to Great Lakes, the recruit training command for one year. Uh, there were two ensigns off the Jersey. The ship was going out of service, so they took two of us, put us out in Great Lakes because they wanted officers closer to the age of the recruits, whereas most of them out there at that time were old Mustangs and grizzled veterans. And, uh, uh, they thought maybe they'd get younger bucks in and more closely identify with the recruits. So uh, I was out there for a year. Then I served on two destroyers, the Putnam and the Cone. Now this is from January 49 until April of 51. And then I got, I remember being, uh, I was ops, ops, operations officer of the Cone. We were down in Guantanamo. We were doing shore bombardment over at uh, Calibra Island. You know near Puerto Rico. And during the uh, lull in the firing, the chief radioman came up to the CIC where I was and he says, boy, he said, I got, I got your orders. And I said, where? He said, boy, he said, I, I've never seen anything like it. He repeated this about three times. And I said, for Christ's sake, chief, where am I going? And he said, you're going to navigate to president's job. So uh, that, that was kind of stunning. But anyway, I got, uh, my wife and I arrived in Washington the same day MacArthur did, where he made his old soldiers never die speech. Truman's, Harry Truman, President Truman's popularity was lower than a snake's belly, like 20%. And I reported aboard the ship and I said, gosh, what's this guy like? And uh, you'll love him. We love him. And my mother-in-law, you should have known better, she says, well, I don't know how you can go serve a traitor of our country. <laughs> but I tell you, Harry Truman was a genuine article in my book. Uh, 